light rail. It's an effective method of public transit that provides a lot of the positives of rail transit while also saving money in construction and vehicle cost. And a lot of cities all across the world have used it to high success. However, a lot of American cities that have light rail networks suffer from lower ridership. But why do a lot of American light rail transit lines fail to get significant ridership? Well, clearly it's because the car is the superior transit mode and everybody should just drive everywhere. Nah, I'm just messing with ya. But it is quite worrying that many American light rail transit lines see lower ridership, as this can bolster arguments against building new transit. But let's see why some of these LRT systems are struggling when it comes to ridership. One of the key factors for low ridership along a majority of these systems is the land use around the stations. One major factor that gets people to take transit is what they can get to from the stations within an easy walking or cycling distance. Generally, successful transit systems will pair stations with land uses that generate transit ridership, such as housing, commercial businesses, office space, schools, and parks. They might even maximize the effectiveness of this by zoning areas for mixed use. Muni Metro is a great example of an agency that has maximized the amount of transit-oriented development surrounding stations. Building lines that serve mixed use, transit-oriented neighborhoods, and the ability to provide transit to these kinds of neighborhoods is definitely a big boost for the system's ridership and continued success. While basically every single light rail transit system in the US has some sort of transit-oriented development surrounding it in some way, a large portion of the stations on these systems are park and rides. A park and ride being a station that is mostly surrounded by, well, you know, Parking. Now, there's really no problem with having a couple of park and rides for a transit system, especially near the ends of the lines to make sure that the system is easier to access for those in more rural or exurban areas trying to get into the city. But when it makes up a good chunk of your system, it can absolutely lower your ridership. People use transit to get from place to place, and when transit only takes you from parking lot to parking lot, then I mean what's the point of even taking transit if you're going between two car-oriented stations? One system that's pretty notorious for this would be DART in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. While it does have a pretty extensive network, especially for a light rail transit system in the Sun Belt, ridership per mile is pretty low. This is mainly due to the vast amount of park and rides outside of the main core of the city. Along with park and rides, lines that run between highways can also contribute to lower ridership. While they can be okay in some cases, just like park and rides, most of the time these stations not only have bad land use around them, but they're also unpleasant places for riders to wait for trains due to noise and air pollution. Buses are the bread and butter of practically every transit agency in the Americas. Bus lines can get service to pretty much any corner of the city, from the most dense neighborhoods to areas that quite literally feel like the middle of nowhere. Buses are super important tools for transit agencies to use, but one thing that many transit agencies, especially in the US, ignore is their potential to use them to boost ridership on other transit lines. One way we can increase ridership both on buses and on our city's light rail transit lines would be to design our buses into a feeder network. A feeder bus network is designed to funnel ridership directly to the light rail transit from the bus lines. Most American transit agencies are unfortunately not very good at utilizing feeder buses. However, Seattle has had some success with feeder buses for Link Light Rail, which has been a huge ridership success as it has some of the highest ridership per mile out of any light rail system in the US. However, a couple of agencies that have seen major success from feeder bus lines are both major cities in the Canadian province of Alberta. They've both seen major ridership gains from utilizing feeder buses for their LRT networks. Actually, by riders per mile, both the C-Train in Calgary and ETS Light Rail in Edmonton are the first and second for ridership in North America outside of Mexico. And honestly, all of those systems deserve their own videos. But regardless, when a light rail transit system lacks connections to the city's bus network, then it's going to have a negative impact on the city's light rail transit system. But do you know what won't lower your city's light rail transit ridership? My Patreon. Even though it won't get your city some new T around the stations, or organize the bus network to be a feeder network, you can still get extra videos, your name in the credits, early access to content, and more. The link's down below, but let's get back into the video. This 
This one seems pretty self-explanatory, but the main point of any transportation is getting you from point A to point B in the fastest, most convenient way, and there's nothing worse than when you have to deviate from that. While most light rail lines in the US are fairly direct, one agency that really has a problem with this is VTA that operates around San Jose, California. Side note, while VTA is pretty bad with having direct lines, I think RTD's R line takes the cake. I mean seriously, just look at this amount of deviation. And when you have deviations like this on the line, it's going to increase the length of travel times between each end of the line, and it also makes transit much less appealing to people who might have used it if it was just a little bit faster. In most cases, light rail is going to have some sections of the trackage where it runs at grade with the streets. This is a totally normal practice for light rail anywhere in the world, but it does cause issues when it comes to the speed of the service. And while you can mitigate problems like waiting at lights with solutions like signal priority and eliminate the possibility of transit being delayed from drivers on the tracks by separating the trackage from the road with buffers, the speed of the trains is going to be limited due to safety concerns. One system that unfortunately suffers a lot from its lack of grade separation is the Metro Light Rail Link in Baltimore, Maryland, which while it is grade separated at some spots outside of downtown Baltimore, in the city itself, the light rail lacks signal priority, which slows down the line and increases delays along the system. Another agency that suffers from slow speeds due to lack of priority is Valley Metro Light Rail in Phoenix, Arizona. While it does have signal priority, most of the line runs in the median of the streets. While this isn't a major problem for most systems, the major issue that stems from this is the speed restrictions caused by this. With most of the line limited to speeds of 35 miles per hour, it takes forever to get across the network. This lack of actual separated right-of-way slows down trains, making it a less viable option for longer trips. It's safe to say that nothing is more frustrating than when you miss a train or a bus, and the next one is a good 15 to 30 minutes from arriving. Frequency is one of the main factors on if someone is going to take transit somewhere or take another mode. One thing that holds true with rapid transit is that if you have to check a schedule for a line instead of just showing up and waiting for the next train to show up, then the system has failed at being rapid transit. One light rail line that just baffles me when it comes to service has to be RTD's our line in the Denver area. And honestly, it really doesn't do anything right. But where it really does a good job at being bad is its frequency. When a light rail line runs less frequently than the nearby A line, which is a regional rail line, then I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that this line has incredibly low ridership. Light rail transit systems need to have good land use around stations, feeder buses to support connectivity, direct routing, transit priority, and frequency in order to see success as a system and get higher ridership. While most American LRT networks are usually good at two or three of these criteria, most are severely lacking in at least one or two of these sections. But are there any systems that do all five really well? Well, I'm glad you asked, because if there's one place that knows how to do its light rail well, we're going to have to take a trip to Canada land, specifically the westernmost prairie province of Alberta. This province, while being pretty well known for being more car dependent than BC or Ontario, is home home to two cities that both have incredibly effective light rail networks. As I said earlier, both Calgary and Edmonton have some of the highest ridership LRT lines in North America, and they both do feeder bus lines to their LRT networks. Well, do they do everything else well? First, let's look at zoning. For both of these networks, ETS and C-Train run through some of the most dense neighborhoods in both Edmonton and Calgary. On top of this, they also have plans to create more transit-oriented development around the existing and future stations. Both systems are fairly straightforward and don't have any major deviations along the lines. Both lines outside of downtown run on their own dedicated right-of-ways, and when they're in downtown, they have signal priority. And both systems generally have frequency 
frequencies on their lines of every 10 to 15 minutes, with some more enhanced service during the rush hour. While ETS and C-Train aren't perfect systems, they definitely provide other transit agencies a look into how they could be making their struggling LRT networks much more functional and practical for riders. Light rail transit in North America isn't going anywhere. With building costs for everything increasing and transit agencies wanting to provide rail transit without breaking their city's budget, if anything, it's only getting more popular to build light rail instead of the more traditional heavy rail metros. Functionally improving light rail is no different than improving any other rail transit service in the US. We still have a long way to go in improving transit, but with agencies like C-Train, ETS, or even Link Light Rail in Seattle, we have some really good examples on how to build effective light rail networks for our cities. And hopefully other cities across North America, whether they want to build new light rail or are struggling to get light rail built, can look to them as examples on how to build better light rail and make our cities is just a little bit better. But are you a fan of light rail? Do you have light rail in your city? How do you think cities can increase their light rail ridership? Let me know down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. I want to thank everybody who helped me make this video. And I also want to thank Tony Stunts and all of the other patrons who support the channel. Want to get extra content, early access to videos, your name in the credits, or just want to support the channel? Then feel free to check out my Patreon, the link is down below. Also while you're down there, you can find links to my other social medias. I post updates and extra content there. And if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching the video, your support is much appreciated. And as always, I'll see y'all on the next one.